Hello and welcome along to the programme. I'm Justin Briley, your host for the next hour and a half here on Premier Christian Radio. This is Unbelievable, the show that gets Christians and non-Christians talking. I hope you enjoy the next hour and a half in my company and uh, I look forward to telling you what's coming up in just a moment. Don't forget, though, that later on this afternoon, after this programme, our youth uh, music programme, Hip Rock UK, coming up and uh, lots more besides this Saturday afternoon, the 18th of December. Not long now till Christmas and I've got special news as well of a special Christmas Day edition of Unbelievable this time next week. Let's find out what's going on on today's programme. You're unbelievable. And it's my great pleasure to welcome back to the studio today Adnan Rashid, who is um, part of the Hitton Institute. He's a, a Muslim speaker and apologist. And uh, today he's in conversation with a guest who's coming on by phone from Australia. Yes, we're an international programme today. Mark Dury is uh, an Australian church leader and author of a book called The Third Choice, Islam, Dimitude and Freedom. And uh, in that book he makes the case that um, the doctrine of dimitude in Islam is an unjust, oppressive and discriminatory code against those of other faiths. Uh, we're going to be finding out what exactly it is and whether it continues today. Mark makes the claim that Muslims are seeking to bring it in various ways to um, Western civilization, um, but we're going to be sort of hearing his story uh, uh, and, and his area of research in this. Mark, thank you for joining me on the program today. It's great to be with you. It's good to have you on. Islam, Dimitude and Freedom is the subtitle of your book, The Third Choice. Uh, many people may not have heard of Dimitude. Could you, in a nutshell, explain what Dimitude is? Yes, uh, Muhammad uh, told his followers when they met non-Muslims to offer them three choices. Uh, one was uh, to fight the sword. The, another was to convert to Islam and become Muslims, and the fighting would then cease. And the third was to surrender and live under Islamic rule. And um, this uh, surrender uh, makes the non-Muslims into a p- particular category of people under the Islamic um, justice or jurisprudence, and they're known as dhimmis. Um, but the name comes from the pact that's understood in Islamic law to be their pact of surrender, which is the Dhimma pact. Um, and um, a Dhimmi is then someone who's not a Muslim living in, in Islamic society. And they were understood to owe their, their lives um, to Muslims, so that is, they were allowed to live and keep their religion on condition of occupying a, a, an inferior uh, place within um, Islamic jurisprudence. And this is the classical view of Islamic law. And there had been some relaxation of some of the principles of Islamic law in treatment of, of non-Muslims, but many aspects of the law still apply in Muslim countries, and there's been a, a trend to uh, bring them back. And uh, so non-Muslims, Christians are the largest group at the moment living under Islamic rule, but, the, but other groups as well are coming under increasing pressure from this system. And dimitude is a word to describe uh, the psychology, the the whole worldview of being a dhimmi, being someone living as a conquered person in your own native lands um, uh, 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 with the conceded but not uh, kind of uh, inherent rights uh, conceded to you by uh, the, the Muslims who at some point in the past conquered your lands. Well, I look forward to hearing sort of w- w- as we get into the discussion more about what that constitutes and, and um, what some of the issues are that, that it raises. Uh, what draw, drew you to actually write on this, uh, Mark? Is is there a significant sort of um, issue here in Australia surrounding this? Do, have you seen examples in Australia where you would say dimitude or those who would wish to bring back aspects of dimitude is is alive and well? Uh, in a somewhat mild way, um, I remember there was a case where a local council had given some land for a multi-religious group of buildings and the Catholics were building a building and Muslims had a building and Muslims created a lot of objections to the Catholic um, plans because the the building was taller than theirs and also they had a cross on the top which the Muslims were offended by and that's a classic Bimi law that non-Muslims are not allowed to display signal symbols particularly the cross in public so that's an example of a a, a local planning issue that was really in some deep way to do with um, Islamic law, but my interest in Islam really uh, was first stirred by living in Aceh in Indonesia doing field work uh, towards a PhD back in the um, late 70s or early 80s and uh, 
um, at that time I, I was interested in Islam itself. And I'm, my book is sort of half about Islam and half about what it means to live under Islamic law. But I've, I've met so many Christians from the Middle East and from Pakistan and, and countries that have lived under Islamic conditions, and um, that's had sort of weighed heavily upon me to hear their stories and realize the often very difficult situation and circumstances that they find themselves in in those countries. Many of the Muslims I engage on this program, um, and last week we heard Adnan talking about it, believe that Islam properly run, as it were, properly instituted, is um, a system whereby people can exist co- you know, happily together, um, and that there has been a golden age, if you like, of Islam that needs to be, in some sense, brought back. Um, in your experience, dimitude, does it live up to that in any sense, or, or do you radically differ from, from, from what Adnan will be talking about today? I think both the... I differ uh, completely. I think both the, the evidence of the Islamic textbooks, that is what the great scholars say the system should look like, and also the historical sources in terms of what the actual lived conditions were of non-Muslims, under Islam, and the evidence today uh, all points to the direction that it's uh, pretty grim to be a non-Muslim living in a Sharia society. You're discriminated against. Your testimony is uh, not valid against the Muslims in court, so you are very vulnerable at law. Um, uh, women are particularly vulnerable. Um, if you break any of the conditions of the Dhimma system, um, whether it's with witnessing to your faith or uh, displaying publicly a symbol of your faith or not paying the discriminatory taxes that were imposed, um, uh, then you could make yourself and your community liable for retribution. Um, and the evidence is that these have, uh, the conditions have been uh, pretty grim, uh, some periods worse than others, but never really a utopia. Um, people sometimes speak of the golden age of Andalusia, for example, but the evidence of Muslim historians was that in, in the ninth, 8th century in, in, in Spain or Andalusia at the time, Christians and Jews had to wear discriminatory patches on their clothes. Uh, um, Jews wore patches in the shape of an ape and Christians of a pig to show that they were different. And, um, uh, you know, at that time, uh, there were um, harems in place that were full of Christian captives that had been taken in warfare against um, uh, the Christian surrounding nations. So this is not really, uh, you know, uh, equality or freedom. Um, Sharia law mandates inequality and inferiority for non-Muslims. And uh, and, and just uh, finally, how, in what sense, you know, did, has dimitude, as it were, disappeared, or has it disappeared and, and is beginning to reappear, which is partly where I think your book book is coming from? Yeah, it never really disappeared. I mean, one of the worst aspects of it, the uh, the payment of the jizya, the scrimmage jizya tax, was largely. Um, not in place in, in the Muslim world, although there are local areas where some Muslims are trying to bring it just, back. Just explain that a little bit. The jizya tax is something that, under uh, the doctrine of dimitude, non-Muslims had to pay a essentially a tax uh, above and beyond yeah. what the, the, the normal citizens would be expected to pay but in order right. to be able I... to carry on being a non-Muslim. The yeah, historical sources suggest it's several times more than the tax that Muslims paid. Um, it's, it's described by Islamic legal textbooks as a redemption for their blood or their life. That is, they would buy their life back for a year. Um, I'm quoting literally from uh, Islamic commentaries. Um, so the idea was that being conquered, you, your captor could have, your conqueror could have killed you, but by living, you live, letting you live, you owe them a debt and you, you buy your life back. It's like a city that pays tribute in order not to be attacked. And again, this is uh, described in detail in many many commentaries and and. Um, so it was a it was a redemption tax, um, and um, this is sort of largely it's not it's not applying now in Muslim countries, although there are radical groups that want it back. But many of the laws of dimitude do apply, and they have been coming back with a vengeance. So, um, for example, in Egypt today, you can't build a church without presidential approval or repair a church without a governor's approval, and the reason for that is that in Sharia law. Um, Dimmies are not supposed to repair or build places of worship. So um, this ancient code from the 7th century is, is controlling and influencing restrictions on uh, worship of Christians in Egypt. And they're incredibly frustrated that they 
Muslims can repair a mosque or build a mosque very easily, but if they want to repair the toilets in the church, they risk a riot if they don't have the approval of the governor. And um, this is very demeaning and humiliating. And uh, it, it's, it's, there have been some very significant riots and, and even people killed by the security forces in Egypt recently over this very issue of refusal of well, permits of well, churches. Well, thank you for sort of outlining the, the, the general area. And now comes the, the discussion between yourself and Adnan. Um, Adnan Rashid is with me, and uh, Adnan is a Muslim, uh, regularly contributes to this program uh, and is part of the Hittin Institute. Adnan, um, I think it's important to distinguish what applies as, as a dhimmi. I, I, in your eyes, am not a dhimmi because we're not living under an Islamic state here in the UK. Um, I am just simply someone of another faith and we coexist. A, a dhimmi, presumably, is someone who, under an Islamic state, holds to a different religion. Um but do you agree with Marx's characterization of dimitude historically and where he sees it in contemporary situations? Um, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah wa ba'd. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mark, for your treatment of this subject um, in your book, firstly and secondly in this debate, or in this friendly dialogue we're having now. Um, I don't agree with Marx's uh, c- characterization of uh, the concept of uh, Ahlul Dhimma or Dhimma in Islam. Mark uh, has picked up this term, dimitude, from Bat Yor, and I can see uh, foreword was done by her. She um, is uh, a Zionist lady uh, who was born in Egypt, and uh, she has uh, clearly demonstrated in her books that she doesn't like Islam. By default, Islam is just not something she will accept. Um, so her works seem to be very biased, and even if you look at some of the academic works in this regard today, um, uh, you hardly see any work, anyone com- quoting her in, in footnotes or in references, uh, even though she has collected a lot of uh, literature in her uh, book. Uh, books. I mean, she's done quite quite few books, like three or four books on on this topic. So. I feel Mark has taken his concept of dhimma from a very biased source, which is Bachi or uh, because Mark simply picked up uh, the term dhimmitude from her. She is the one who coined the term. Uh, the concept of dhimma is um, not very complicated in Islam. It simply um, uh, it simply means in Arabic dhimma, the the ones you take responsibility for. Uh, Ahl al-Dhimma are the ones you take responsibility for and you are responsible for their protection. So these are the people who will pay you a small amount of tax in uh, in return for protection given by the state because they are different. They are not Muslims. Now there is a perception among uh, some of the authors such as Mark Dury here um, that this tax was uh, very high and people were paying these amounts uh, um under severe pressure, which doesn't seem to be the case historically, which and I will substantiate that through quoting some some of the sources I have in front of me, some of the academic sources, um, uh, unlike uh, Bart Yor. Um We find out when we study the historical works, uh, such as Kitab al-Khiraj, written by Qadi Abu Yusuf in the second century of Islam, who collected these sources from the Islamic literature um, to... Uh, basically, the book is written about uh, taxes in Islam, and the the book Kitab al Khiraj, the book of taxes, what what it is called, states clearly that uh, you charge one dinar per head from um, um, a rich non-Muslim um, and someone who's uh, um, a middle-class non-Muslim. You charge them uh, twenty-four dirhams, twenty-four silver coins, and someone who is like uh, uh, not very well off, you charge them twelve dirhams. Um, so the highest amount of tax a non-Muslim would be paying in an Islamic state would be equivalent to one gold coin, one dinar, and that's equivalent to almost 50 pounds today, or maximum 80 pounds today, depending on how much four gram of gold would be worth today. Um, but but it, regardless of what the amount might be, and Mark may differ from you, it, what, it, what it sounds like, in, mm-hmm. in some sense, is like a protection racket, you know, like the mafia would, would have, you know, pay us and we won't basically come and beat your doors down of your restaurant. Uh, I mean, it, it, essentially, you call it um, looking after them, but, but is it not, as Mark has described, essentially paying money so that they're not killed by their Muslim um, conquerors? 
You, um, okay, that, that that's an interesting uh, um, comparison with, with mafia and how the government would react or how would how the government would act uh, if the tax wasn't paid. But in if 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 you study the history of Islam carefully, you'll come to realize that those who refused the Muslims, those Muslims who refused to pay the tax, which is zakat, which is compulsory charity, if you refuse to pay that tax, you are also treated as the non-Muslims will be treated if they refuse to pay their tax. So even the Muslims are paying uh, tax under a different name. So zakat is 2.5% of every single Muslim's savings, while in the case of the non-Muslims, you only pay a limited set amount, which is one dinar, whether you're a millionaire or a pauper, it doesn't really matter. You pay one set amount. But with the Muslims, they very often end up paying high amounts, much higher than what the non-Muslims are paying, I mean, historically. Just just coming back to the title of Mark's book, which is The Third Choice, he calls it that because the the option of becoming a dimmer was the third choice. It, when when um, a, a country was conquered by Islam, the, the, the individual could either convert to Islam, um, be, be executed, or become a dimmer, pay the tax and live under these certain codes and rules etc um, do you agree with that fundamental no. uh, kind of description of, of what the choices were to a person who when when um, an Islamic state was established well Mark is right when he says that there were three choices given uh, this was done in the the seventh century uh, in the in the beginning stages of uh, the Islamic ex- expansion as we know it in history but after the Muslims had conquered these lands uh, there was no third choice. There were Muslim, non-Muslims who were living uh, with the Muslims, and they were born of Christian and Jewish and and and, uh, and Zoroastrian families, and they were living as non-Muslims under Muslim rule. They were not given three choices. They were not given a choice of convert, or fight, or pay jizya. They were simply born as al dimma the people who were protected people, and they lived as that until they died. And this pattern continued until the Ottomans were governing uh, as, uh, till 1924. So um, I don't think Mark uh, has put it quite accurately. All right, if, if let, that's let, what he means. Let, 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 you're listening to uh, um, just before we come back to Mark for for his uh, response, uh, a program looking at the issue of dimitude. Uh, if you're not familiar with that term, it's uh, well essentially a doctrine in Islam about how those under Islam who are not non-Muslims should be treated. And in, in his book, The Third Choice, Mark Dury makes the case that um, it is an oppressive and discriminatory code. Uh, on the other hand, Adnan Rashid, my Muslim guest today, says it is a just rule of Islam and it um, provides for the protection of people who uh, are not Muslims in certain situations. Does it continue today? Um, are Muslims seeking to bring it back in some sense to uh, places where uh, it has not been around for a while? Well, that is the contention of Mark in his book. Uh, so we're going to continue uh, today. And if you'd like to respond to anything you hear on the show today, I do encourage you to get in touch. You can email unbelievable at premier.org.uk. And don't forget this program available right now as a podcast at premier.org.uk forward slash unbelievable. Unbelievable with Justin Brierley. Coming back to you, Mark, uh, what's your response then to, to Adnan? He says, uh, ultimately, you've, you've mischaracterized dimitude. It wasn't nearly as um, expensive, if you like, to pay this juicy tax as, as you make out. And, um, you know, the, the idea that they were somehow oppressed um, is simply overstating the case. And even to suggest that these were the only three options available, uh, convert, be killed, or become a dimmy um, is, is also a misrepresentation. What's your response? I'm very confident in the accuracy of, of, of what I've described. I looked at more than 80 uh, commentaries on the Quran um, and uh, many other Islamic sources. Most of the sources in my book are in fact Islamic uh, authorities. Um, let me quote Abu Yusuf who was referred to for his work on uh, the revenues of the Islamic State. He said um, that um, uh, the the jizya as part of the fay, which is part of uh, the, the, the income that comes to the state, um, comes to the to the Muslims um, or is restored to Muslims um, uh, from uh, by non-Muslims who've made peace on the condition of paying the jizya, this poll tax, to save themselves from slaughter. Uh, so it's very clear in his description that that's the purpose of of the payment of the tax. 
I disagree with Adnan's description of the dhamma as, as meaning responsibility. In fact, in fact, the Arabic word dhamma, from which the word is derived, means to, to find fault with or censure. And I think it's more accurately described as a pact of liability or, or of blame. And there is a liability, really, for your life. As for what the actual taxes are, um, there's quite a lot of documentary evidence on this. Um, Arthur Triton, looking at papyri records from the 8th century in Egypt, um, found that um, on average the the jizya payments were um, around three or four months' wages for a day labourer. So about um, uh, 30% or so of... Um, of uh, of the uh, of of your annual wage was being paid in Jizya at the time, and there's lots of evidence of people um, from the eighth right through the Middle Ages in Egypt having to flee because they couldn't pay the taxes or uh, selling their children to slavery in order to pay the taxes. But um, Goitain, in his study of Geniza documents from from uh, Cairo. Uh, said that people would just take to wandering as beggars because they'd run out of money or they'd go into hiding. Um, um, people, a lot of laments about the unbearable burden of the taxation. So I, I think um, that there's, a, there's quite a lot of misrepresentation here. And Islamic sources as well uh, speak about the, heavy, uh, the heaviness of, of the burden. One of the problems about this system is that it's really very oppressive and an unpleasant subject, but there's a lot of um, propaganda, really, uh, and... Um, uh, a, a kind of a, a polishing up of history to make it sound good. I, I do take very strong ex exception to the claim that my book is just based on, um, but your, uh, as I said, I was very careful to rely primarily on um, the sources of Islamic jurists and Islamic authorities as well as contemporary documentary evidence. When you talk about the fact that there's uh, a certain embellishment or um, tidying up um, in terms of the, the propaganda, as you call it, of surrounding these types of doctrine, I mean, you, you don't you pull your punches in the book. Um, you, you effectively suggest uh, near the start of the third choice that Muslims are, if you like, given permission in the Quran to lie for the sake of the spread of Islam. Um, and is this, is this something you would say is occurring when it comes to the justifications for Dima and for the, the types of things that you, that you see as uh, happening today in, in an Islamic context? I think that's a very complex uh, question. Under certain circumstances, deception is permissible or even obligatory in Islam. Um, the classic case uh, is really when Muslims feel threatened or under, under pressure. Uh, under danger, and they're, they're, they depend upon non-Muslims for their safety. Um, and some might also regard it as part of warfare, of of, uh, of jihad or conflict. I think um, some, I believe, some Muslim scholars do deceive about the issue of the Dimma Pact. Others are, are deceived by their view of the perfection of Islam. That is, it's a doctrine of faith that Islam must have been perfect. And so they read the evidence um, in a very um, biased way. They pull out the bits that, dis that seem to fit with that prejudice and ignore the evidence to the contrary. Um, and Let, very, let's, uh, let, I, I, let's allow Adnan to, to come in here because, because Adnan, on last week's program, you were, you were describing, as I say, what you saw as a golden age of Islam, which presumably is what, what Mark is referencing here, that, that there has been, if you like, some epoch in, in Islamic uh, history where things were done correctly and, and there was this, this peace and the harmony that Islam brought even with people who, who uh, were, were, not, were non-Muslims. Mark says, okay, he struggles to find this supposed golden age. W what is your proof for, for, the, for, for, for the, that Islam does work and dim, the, dim, the doctrine of dimitude can be implemented in a just way? Right, I'll look into that once we study some of the evidence in front of me. It's quite interesting that Mark has actually um, accused some of the scholars of deliberately deceiving uh, the masses into believing that dimmi or, dim, or dimitude, as he puts it, is something uh, attractive. Well, uh, Mark, let me um, uh, um, inform you on this point that I've been, I've been studying Islam for almost 10 years and I haven't come across uh, any Muslim scholar 
who believes in deliberately lying to spread his religion is absolutely forbidden it's absolutely haram in Islam to lie to spread this religion to propagate the religion of Islam however um, it is allowed in Islam to save your life uh, by lying uh, if, if, if there is a sword on your head and you are about to be killed then in that case you're allowed to blaspheme not lie sorry I mean I, let me rephrase my sentence here again uh, you're not allowed to lie but you're allowed to uh, utter blasphemy in order to save, save your life if someone is asking you to commit blasphemy uh, to save your life you are allowed to do that and it's very clear in the Quran but nowhere in the Quran it states that you are allowed to lie to propagate your religion no we're not allowed to lie about our religion once we are talking about it now coming to the issue of uh, the money the tax and uh, as um, um, uh, Mark has disputed my claim C- could we come to that in just a moment because we're just running out of time okay. on this section and and sure. we're, we're, we will um, hear your response there um, Adnan Adnan Rashid my Muslim guest today on the program in conversation with Mark Jury who's on the line from Australia he's a church leader and author of the third choice Islam dimitude and freedom um, we are finding out what dimitude is and the different uh, interpretations that Mark and Adnan have about it and um, how it treats, uh, how it has historically treated, how it maybe currently treats uh, non-Muslims uh, I- I under that doctrine. So uh, do join us again for uh, the next part of the programme, Unbelievable, the show that brings Christians and non-Christians together. With me, your host, Justin Briley, here on Premier Christian Radio. You're listening to Unbelievable on Premier Christian Radio. Welcome back to the programme. I'm Justin Briley. We're talking about Islam and Christianity today, particularly looking, though, at Islam and uh, the way uh, under Islamic law uh, non-Muslims are treated. And uh, Mark Jury has written a book on this. He's an Australian church leader, author of The Third Choice. And uh, this book talks about the concept of dimitude. And uh, Mark says that it is a system of law that specifically oppresses and discriminates against non-Muslims. It has existed historically and it continues to exist in various forms. Uh, Adnan Rashid is my Muslim guest on the program today. He disputes that this is the correct way of understanding dimitude. But, but we did kind of just have... Um, Adnan there refuting this idea that uh, Islam allows lying in order to advance the religion. He says the only instance he could come across of that is that um, when uh, someone's life is at stake, there is a permission given to blaspheme in order to save the life of a Muslim. Um, Mark, is you obviously read it very differently to that. Yeah, I think that's, that is in the Quran, that, that principle. But Islam is also based on the life of Muhammad, and there are a number of instances um, which jurists have used to justify um, the use of deception. Uh, for example, in warfare, um, Muhammad licensed that uh, in, in, in fighting others and sometimes in resolving disputes. Uh, there are a number of circumstances, and, and philosophers like al-Ghazali, um, uh, one of the great Muslim writers, um, did gen- develop a sort of general theology of lying which allowed it to be used. Um, if the goal was a good goal, then the means could be put to that end. But I think the actual thing, effect of this is very complex, and I think a lot of it is wishful thinking, but it's very selective reading of the sources. So people overlook what they don't want to hear, and they present the, the, best, of, the best of it, really, and ignore the evidence to the contrary. So a lot of it is more kind of um, trying to... It's, it's the spin problem rather than the direct deception, although that sometimes is an issue as well. I mean, I don't want us to get too derailed by, by this issue because it's it's not kind of central to, to what we're talking about today. But um, obviously, let's agree that the, you have a different understanding of, of where this yeah. is coming from. Absolutely. Um, yes, I know what Mark is referring to. Mark is referring to a tradition from the Prophet that war is deception. And this is what the, the scholars have been commenting on. Um, yes, war is deception. That's what uh, war is. In war, uh, you deceive, you lie, and you, you try to cheat your enemy uh, it, because you're trying to defeat your enemy. So a war is a human phenomenon, and all human beings have uh, uh, dealt with war in similar way. So this is about war. But we're talking about the mitude here. Uh, a suggestion was made that uh, Muslims are allowed 
to deceive in order to advance their religion. Perhaps I misunderstood it, but it is utterly forbidden in Islam to to advance our religion by lying. Coming back to the issue of taxes, uh, the issue of um, how much the non-Muslims have to pay. I have an historical. I have a historical source right here in front of me, and I would like to speak with substance, uh, as Mark uh, uh, would like me to do. Um, there is uh, a treaty which took place in Islamic Spain in the year 11, so, uh, sorry, 713, in the year 713 CE. This treaty is quoted by Olive, uh, Olivia uh, Constable in her book, Medieval Iberia. Um, the treaty states, uh, in the name of Allah, the merciful, the compassionate, this is a document granted by Abdulaziz bin Musa bin Nusayr to Theodomir, son of Gabdush, establishing a treaty of peace and a promise and protection of God and his prophet. We Muslims will not set special conditions for him or for any among his men, nor harass him, nor remove him from power. His followers will not be killed or taken prisoner, nor will they be separated from their women and children. They will not be cursed in matters of religion. Their churches will not be burnt, nor will sacred objects be taken from them. Um... As long as he remains, Theodomir remains sincere and fulfills the conditions we have set for him, he has reached a settlement concerning seven towns. He will not give shelter to fugitives, nor to our enemies, nor encourage any protected persons to fear us, nor conceal news of our enemies. He and each of his men shall also pay one dinar every year. One dinar every year. So this is one dinar per head every year. So this is clear-cut evidence in front of us from the 8th century, 713 CE, from Spain, where Muslims are demanding one dinar from the Christians uh, in order to receive that protection. And the protection. And, and it's a sort of peace treaty, really. It's, that, it's a that, peace treaty. That, 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 this is what the Dhimma contract is. This is exactly what Dhimma contract, the responsibility, the protection contract stands for. Now, um, there are other similar treaties. The, the Treaty of Jerusalem, the Treaty of Najran is similar, the Treaty of Medina is very similar. So these are the terms which were granted, which were given, offered to the Christians. How do the Christians react now? The question is, uh, Mark seems to be presenting a picture which is very, very hostile, very, very uh, ugly. That, that once, uh, once. Well, that you, sorry, if, if, what if, were you if, saying? If, you, you reject yeah. what? Sorry. I reject the, the accusation of hostility. I'm trying to be objective and clear, and and referencing Islamic sources and also contemporary historical sources. Um, because it portrays Islam in a negative, that doesn't mean I'm hostile. It just means I'm trying to be accurate. The, 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 uh, you know, attributing someone with, um, un, un, uh, with, with wrong motives is no answer to the, to the argument that they put. Okay, okay, I, I, I appreciate that. Um, may, perhaps um, I'm, I have I misunderstood uh, okay. what Mark but, but is trying to say. Uh, the, the point remains that, that as far as you look at the evidence, yeah. um, Adnan, these uh, pacts, these treaties that were drawn up, these dimitude pacts, were were essentially peace treaties, and they, they were not. They were not aimed at subjugating exactly. another. And uh, and, and, and if we look at the evidence from the Christians and the Jews, uh, let's see what they had to say themselves. Uh, if we go to the Christian sources, what the Christians were writing themselves, we come to realize that they were living in peace and they actually enjoyed their lives under Muslim rule. For example, in the year 869 CE, Patriarch Theodosius of Jerusalem wrote to his, 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 his friend in Constantinople, the Patriarch of Constantinople, he wrote, The Saracens, i.e. the Muslims, show us great goodwill. They allow us to build our churches and to observe our own customs without hindrance. Okay, okay. Then, well, 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 that's great. I, I mean, you've, you've certainly out, out, outlined there, there are multiple examples, in your view, that, that, that would contradict Mark's analysis. Mark, what, what, is it just that you've got a different set of examples and, and you can show that there are... Uh, uh, you know, I instances in which it, it was a lot more uh, host uh, hostile situation for, for non-Muslims. There are many, many cases, uh, it, a lot of evidence that it wasn't this, this kind of idealised situation. Um, often the lived reality was worse than the, the what the legal textbook said. Um, and you, you get you get voices, for example, a Jewish merchant from medieval Sicily under Islamic rules saying that the Zimis were preferred death to life. Most of them, he said, are poor and destitute. Uh, many fled. Um, it's uh, James Riley, who was a ship's captain from a U.S. shipwreck in, in Morocco and uh, enslaved, describes how if uh, Jews were too poor to pay the jizya, they were just beaten until they converted to Islam. Um, the, 
this kind of idealized uh, picture of history, which um, assumes it sort of portrays a perfect, uh, unchanging, um, uh, utopian kind of conception, and and is very happy to pick out a a phrase here or a phrase there to justify it and ignores overwhelming evidence uh, the other way uh, is really unhelpful and is part, I think, of the um, of, of the really the misleading of people over, over the historical reality and the problems that uh, groups like um, the cops in Egypt today or Christians in Pakistan are facing are very serious human rights issues are really a, continu- a direct continuation of 1400 years of, uh, of I think I would call it abuse and, and uh, domination and I, I sometimes I feel it's quite sad when I hear Muslims who as I said have a kind of idealized theological conception of the perfection of Islam and impose that on the evidence and are willing to rely on um, cherry-picked sources uh, to, to present that view uh, and then overlook even the evidence of, of their own sources even the evidence of Muslim authoritative Muslim sources which describe a very different reality. I would, I would say, Mark, uh, it's, it's an interesting claim. Would you like to quote some sources and tell us where um, uh, um, we find uh, um, statements telling us that we must treat the non-Muslims and dhimmis uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way which is not fair, which is not just, or anything like that? I mean, you, you have made a lot of claims. You have made a lot of um, interesting claims, but you haven't put out any substance and you have written a book so you should be able to bring out Let, something Let's allow Mark to do that then Well I, I quote from um, almost 30 Tafsir uh, commentaries uh, in, my, in my explanation of Surah 929 which is the key um, verse in the Quran referring to the state um, uh, you, I quote for example from Ibn Kathir's commentary which he says that non-Muslims should be belittled and disgraced and humiliated um, uh, there are, um, uh, I quote from um, Ibn Rushd, Rushdi um, Averroes, who said uh, the Muslim jurists agree that the purpose of fighting the people of the book is either for their conversion to Islam or their payment of the jizya. Um, and uh, I go into quite considerable detail. Explaining you, you also bring, it, bring up a number of instances of sort of um, historical uh, accounts of these actual payments, these annual sort of payments, uh, and, and you describe these sort of ve- very um, worrying practices whereby there, the, it was all very symbolically done, whereby the, um, yeah. the dhimmi would enter into the presence of the Muslim authority. They would be come, come in on their knees, um, they would sort of be slapped. There, there were various aspects to this to, to, in order to demean... The neck. To, to, uh, the, the, the foot would be placed on the neck when they actually delivered the tax over. Uh, and for you, this is all actually about not just the, the tax, it's about the, the actual um, way that the dhimmis were being made to feel, the, 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 if you like, the psychological effect of the dhimmitude. Oh, that's right. Um, Al Baidawi said that um, when they pay the tax, they will, they will be um, uh, struck and... Um, they would. They, they have to undergo the. the struck on the. Uh, even Abbas, sorry, said that uh, the dhimmi must be struck on the neck as they pay. It's. A, I think it's a symbolic blow on the head to show that they're escaping with their with their head intact through the through the ritual. Um, and you know, uh, other other jurists or, 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 or writers of commentaries, Allah Lucy said the um, the jizya is a payment um, as a reward for being given a pardon for death. Uh, Muhammad ibn Yusuf at Fayish, uh, in his commentary, said that the jizya is a satisfaction for their blood. It's a payment to substitute for the duties, the wajib of killing and slavery for the benefit of Muslims. Well, there are many Muslim commentaries that explain the meaning of the jizya and of the of the tax. Um, Al Zamakshari uh, uh, explains about the, um, the, the 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 ritual of the payment of the tax and. It's, um, this, this is a very copiously documented. It's just that these things are not usually brought into the light of day. Well, uh, well obviously that's what that your book is aiming to do, but, but Adnan, I'm sure you want to respond. I yes. mean, th- this sounds terrible, the, these, these kinds of rituals that were okay. associated with, uh, with the dimity. I'm, I'm very confident that Mark will not be able to pull anything out uh, to support these statements made, made by these later jurists from the Prophet. If Mark can pull out something from the Quran or from 
uh, a prophetic tradition, I will accept. I will submit. I can very quite, uh, humbly um, challenge Mark to bring something out from the Prophet where Prophet said to strike the non-Muslims in this way, humiliate them in this way, or mistreat them in this way. In fact, what the Prophet said in Sahih al-Bukhari in the book of Jihad, which is the most authentic book after the Quran, um, in, uh, he's, pro- the Prophet stated that if anyone who kills a dhimmi, a mu'ahid, someone we have a contract with, such a person will never smell the fragrance of paradise. Okay? Yeah, I cite and that, 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 that um, um, yes. in my book. Yes. I did cite that in my L- book and explain that, that, that the... Uh, sure. If, 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 you, if you let me finish, Mark, very quickly. Umar bin Khattab, in the same chapter, in the Book of Jihad, the second caliph of Islam, on his deathbed, he stated that whoever succeeds me as caliph must not put a burden upon the non-Muslims more than they can bear, must fight for them if he has to, to protect them, and preserve their rights and fulfill promises with them. So these statements which come from the Prophet and the, his closest companions are what we follow. Uh, this is what Sharia is. Sharia, when we when we use the word Sharia in a loose sense, we must define what Sharia is in the first place. Sharia comes from the Quran and from the prophetic tradition. What Alusi, or what Zamakhshari, what Baydawi, what Ibn Kathir, Ibn Taymiyyah, and these later jurists were uh, saying, reflecting the thought and the, the, the conditioning of their own time, is not what we follow. For example, these most of these scholars uh, Mark has mentioned were living very close to the time of the Crusades, okay? And there was a very, very um, deep hatred uh, to be found among the Muslims f- uh, for the Christians and vice versa because of the wars. Um, so, well, well, I'd be interested in getting your res- response to that, Mark. I mean, it was is this kind of isolated cases that don't reflect the actual... Um, uh, scriptures of Islam, or, or do you feel that the these the, the, these impl- the way it was implemented does, in some sense, reflect the the spirit of what what is taught in in uh, the Quran and the Hadith? I think it, there is a, a kernel of truth here. That is the elaboration of all the laws of the Bima, and even of the ritual uh, 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 of the payment of the tax, uh, did take place over some centuries. So and. Um, uh, so there were many, many, many laws and restrictions added over time. Um, however, that's the reality of what Islam has been and is. The, the humiliating jizya payment ritual continued for the Jews in Afghanistan right up until the 1950s. So you might say, well, some of those details are in medieval commentaries. But yes, those commentaries determined how states and rulers um, practiced their um, their religion, and, and there are lots of uh, uh, observers like that shipwrecked Captain Riley in Morocco who describes those these rituals being applied. So um, that's one point. Secondly, um, Ibn Abbas is the is the authority, who's the companion of Muhammad, as the um, as the source for this next striking is cited in the in the commentaries. Thirdly, the commentators in in explaining these principles of humiliation, they're really meant to humiliate the non-Muslims do it on the basis of Surah 929, which speaks about the Muslims as non-Muslims as uh, paying the tax and also being made small. So this is interpreted as what being tiny or low or small means. Um, and it's very much a, a pious attempt to apply the Quran's teaching that uh, the people of the book, when they are conquered, be- Before we go to, be to a response from, from Adnan, I mean, you, you kind of not only draw out the historical nature of these things, but, but you make um, a, a, an allusions to the fact that the way Muslims want to be treated today has its roots in this, this issue of dimitude. So, so you, you talk about the fact that the way that Muslim um, Islamic response to criticism and, and the feeling that, um, that if you like, not, not being open to, to criticism of any kind the way that we see responses to that all stems from this issue of, of the, the subjugation of other belief systems to Islam. So, so all, although obviously we don't see these rituals being enacted today, what you're saying is the the impact continues in the mindset of Islam today. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that is a problem. Um, the Quran does teach Muslims that, the, that Islam Muslims are superior, and I think many Muslims do have a sense of their superiority. And it can feel deeply offended if they feel belittled or um, humiliated, they will often say, by things that happen. 
And so this this concept of honor and humiliation uh, and superiority, inferiority, this way of looking at the world, which has shaped the position of non-Muslims under Islam, um, is is a, is a big challenge for Muslims living in the in you know on an equal basis with other people. Because if you're if you're really concerned about um, status, inferiority, superiority, it I think it colours. In fact, I think it damages the way you see yourself. And I I think that. Um, what we're seeing often is that um, there's almost a demand that Islam be respected, a demand that Muslims be treated as somehow a special case and and a superior in a sense. Um, and that's not very helpful. Uh, it's not good for Muslims. Uh, let, let, me, let me ask people. what Adnan makes of that. I mean, I, I think a lot of people will will hear what Mark's saying there and think, yeah, that that's the way Muslims do seem to act, you know, as though... We need to be given special privileges and um, never to be questioned, um, never to sort of, you know, p- some people do have that view of Islam as being very um, concerned with its honor. And if you ever do anything to disrespect, then it, as we were saying last week, you know, the way Muslims often in the gra- on the ground react well, to things like the Danish cartoons, the, the Pope's comments, are it's violence, it's, you know, it, it, it's extreme is any Reac- of that kind reaction, of, as, as Mark would suggest, um, coming coming from this kind of his, history of the the issue of honor and subjugation in well, Islam? Well, in, in my humble opinion, um, Christianity has the history of suppressing the free, uh, freedom to express oneself or freedom of um, conscience. For example, we have the uh, example of Inquisition, Crusades, all these t- things were taking place. And now Mark, as a Christian, would... Um, would say no. Uh, this is this was against the teachings of Christ. We we follow Christ. We follow the tradition. We follow the early apostles. Uh, we don't listen to these things. We don't pay any attention to them. Even though we can find uh, few Christian authors here and there in the Middle Ages condemning such practices, mm. uh, such as Crusades, Inquisition, and burning of witches. So, if I was to draw draw um, a similar analogy or a similar comparison. Uh, between what the Christians do today and what, or what they seek to do today uh, and what they did in the Middle Ages, it would be very unfair. I mean, I, w- I wouldn't do that because we are living in different realities. Uh, and you well, feel come, Mark shouldn't attempt to do that either? No, no because to be consistent, if Mark is telling us that this is to be found in uh, medieval literature, uh, if Mark was to go back and study, for example, Navi, Imam Navi, when he was commenting on these uh, rituals such as slapping and, and, and discriminating uh, discriminating against the Jews and the Christians, he condemned such practices. He said these practices are not proven from the Sunnah of the Prophet. This was not the way of the Prophet. This is not the way of the Quran. We shouldn't be indulging in these practices. We should discourage them. So there was a debate between Muslim theologians and jurists uh, as to what we should be doing with the Christians when we receive jizya. And, and most jurists um, uh, agreed that... Um, um, jizya sh- must be taken and it must be taken in the way the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us to take it. So uh, what the med- medieval uh, authors are writing and expressing their views uh, obviously uh, reflecting uh, the conditions of their times such as crusades and other hostile experiences they had with uh, the Christians of their time uh, is not reflected in the early teachings what, of what, Islam. What, what, what then is the cause of the the reaction that many Muslims have when they hear their religion in any way criticized or um, in, in any way insulted, which to, to so many people seems so unnecessarily aggressive and, and violent. Okay, this, this would be understood if, uh, if, not, if the scholars or commentators or authors uh, like Mark Thierry were, were to sit down and study uh, the concept of love for the Prophet in Islam. Uh, we love our prophet, uh, not that Christ, the Christians don't love their prophets. Of course they do. We love our prophet in a different way. We love our prophet too much, uh, and 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 uh, to and, a fault, uh, almost. <laughs> I wouldn't say to a fault, but uh, we are. It's it's one of the tenets of Islam to love your prophet and, and to love him more him, and accord him honor. Uh, exactly to love him more than your parents. So if, uh, for example, any 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 human being, any any. Um, 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 standard um, person walking on the street with his girlfriend or with his wife, if his wife or girlfriend was insulted in front of him, he would definitely stand up to defend her. Uh, we we deem the Prophet much higher in respect than our wives, our mothers, our fathers, our grandparents, all of them. 
So we have to respect and protect his honor. Um, and the way we do it is to um, follow the laws of Islam. But, but that presumably doesn't justify the way that some people No, of course respond. not. Of course not. The mob, mob, Islam doesn't have a mob culture. Islam doesn't promote mob culture. We don't believe in mob violence. But, but it justice. perhaps explains where the mentality comes from, even if it's sometimes expressed no, no, wrongly. It's, it's, if, if we were to um, uh, do a comparison between Muslims and Christians of Nigeria, for example, Muslims were burning uh, the effigies of George Bush and Tony Blair or some of the... Um, um, cartoonists uh, and if we were to go to Nigeria and look at some of the Christians behaving in a similar manner we can't b blame Christianity for that what they're doing we, we, we have to blame ig the ignorance they okay. are suffering from um, we, we just got um, a, a couple of minutes for you to respond Mark and then we'll, we'll enter the final part of our program what, what, what do you make of that analysis that, that, that Adnan's given for, for where these sorts of issues arise um, as far as the, the Muslim view of the, the the prophet and the love they have for him. I think the um, you can you can love someone enormously, but it doesn't mean you're prepared to um, strike or kill someone for it, for for speaking ill of them. That's a different issue. It's not just love. Um, it's another factor, and I think the real motivation or the real reason has to do with the uh, early uh, origins of Islam and um, Muhammad himself. Uh, did uh, condone uh, those who used violence to stand up for his reputation. Um, um, there's, a, there's a hadith of a man who killed his slave wife because she was uh, insulting or speaking ill of Muhammad, and he, Muhammad approved of this. Um, so, and there are other examples as well. He, Muhammad was pretty uncompromising uh, about people that made funny songs about him. And so I think the actual, um, and this is reflected, as Adnan said, or sort of indicated in Sharia law that it, it's um, the very, very uh, uh, extreme penalties for those that mock Muhammad or, or mock Islam. And uh, that's very much based on the foundations of Islam. I don't think it's driven by love. It's driven by um, something else, um, a deeper thing. Uh, the other thing I want to say is that very much about my book, um, the principles that are laid out there don't, don't derive just from the period of the Crusades. They go back to the 9th and even the 8th century in, in, in Egypt today, as I explained, it's very difficult to build a church or repair a church. Very extreme restrictions on, on building and repairing places of worship. That goes back to the Pact of Ulmar, to the conquest of Palestine, to the early covenants of surrender of the non-Muslims. It's the, back to the very earliest period of Islam, and um, it's, uh, it's part of the root. And um, that's, a, that's a, a serious problem, and that's also explains why the issue has been so enduring, why um, Muslims, pious Muslims around the world are not rising up and uh, telling the Egyptian government they should let Christians build churches and repair churches. They're not saying the example of Muhammad demands that you should give the Christians these rights. They're, they're actually not doing that, and the reason is that there isn't that basis in, in the foundations of Islam. We're going to have to take a quick break, and then I will let Adnan respond. I can see you're, you're um, ready to, to respond to what Mark has said there. But you're listening to an edition of Unbelievable, looking at the issue of Islam, dimitude and freedom. That's the subtitle of Mark Jury's book, The Third Choice. Um, uh, Mark has been making the case on the program today that the doctrine of dimitude, the way that uh, non-Muslims are treated under Islamic law, is an oppressive and discriminatory code that endures in many ways today. Uh, Adnan Rashid of the Hitton Institute has been contending that uh, this is a, uh, a very one-sided way, of a biased view of, of what dimitude comprised. It was essentially peace treaties uh, that uh, ensured safety and peace um, within those borders. Uh, I encourage you to, to get the book if you want to look at that. I'll also be posting up links to other resources that uh, Adnan will recommend uh, with the podcast of this program. So premier.org.uk slash unbelievable. If you want to listen back to the program and uh, click through to some of the uh, links to books and, and other resources that are there. Uh, back in just a moment's time as we conclude today's program. Welcome back to the final part of Unbelievable this Saturday afternoon. Hope you're ready for Christmas, and uh, if you are or if you're not, you'll want to tune in anyway uh, on Christmas Day to Unbelievable. We've got a special show for you. It's the Unbelievable Christmas Cracker. I'm going to be joined by a variety of guests. Uh, Anthony McCroy will be my studio guest, and we'll be linking up with international guests, defenders of the Christian faith around the world, to talk about various aspects of Christmas, including uh, what about people who claim it's just a pagan festival, 
Um, what about those who say that uh, there are other accounts of the Christmas story in other uh, extra biblical gospels? And we'll be having a bit of a fun look at things like Father Christmas. Uh, are there any Christian roots to him? And Christmas trees, do they descend from pagan traditions? Well, uh, my guest Anthony McCroy says no, and he's going to be offering evidence to suggest that both Father Christmas and Christmas trees are in fact uh, have Christian roots. So uh, it should be a fascinating programme next week, uh, quite light-hearted as well. We're not being quite so adversarial as we normally are on this programme. Uh, so do join me for that, the unbelievable Christmas cracker between 2.30 and 4 o'clock here on Premier Christian Radio, and of course online at premier.org.uk slash unbelievable don't forget your feedback coming up towards the end of today's program in the meantime let's return to today's topic you're listening to unbelievable on premier christian radio and we're concluding today's program on uh, islam and uh, the the kind of religious freedoms that it allowed uh, historically um, under its rule for those it, it, where islam had become the dominant uh, religion had conquered other peoples and tribes and religions uh, was there a just if you like system in place uh, was there a, a golden age of Islam when peace reigned and there was if you like a, a mutual harmony and respect well uh, Mark Dury the, uh, the, the Australian pastor who has published the book The Third Choice claims that that, that is a little bit of a uh, an overstatement at the least um, Adnan Rashid says actually no there, there has been a golden age and there can be again uh, dimitude is not what Mark describes it as. Um, and then you wanted to respond, I think, to, to, to the way Mark was characterizing uh, the fact he, he was saying in that last section that actually these practices were not just responding to the issues of the Crusades, etc. You can see them having gone quite far back uh, in, m- m- even m- to Muhammad himself, in the way he, he treated people who, yes. who mocked him. Um Mocking is uh, another issue altogether. That, 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 that's the topic we discussed last week, and this is another topic in itself, that uh, whether Islam allows freedom to insult any of the messengers of God, for example, Jesus, Moses, or Muhammad. Islam doesn't allow that freedom. It, it is the law of Islam, and that's how it stands. Um, uh, coming to the issue of uh, Prophet Muhammad uh, uh, accepting the uh, execution of someone who insulted him. I mean, even if you go to the Bible, Jesus Christ, he gives a parable of a king, and the king states that uh, those who would not uh, uh, have me reign over them, I would bring them hither and kill them, okay? And Mark would say it was a parable, but the question is, why would Jesus put that parable forward in the first place? What is he trying to tell his companions. So it's a parable with a message uh, in it. So Jesus was not a pacifist, as some Christians would like to put it. C- coming um, back to the issue of um, dimitude, for example, uh, what, what Mark is saying, again, I really, really have strong reservations uh, against uh, some of the views put by Mark, because modern scholarship, uh, if we study some of it, we come to realize that they have um, um, uh, other conclusions to draw from some of the early history of Islam. For example, Professor Dean Philip Bell in his book Jews in Early Modern Europe states that Jews had their golden age under the rule of Islam from the year 900 to 1300. This is what Dean Philip Bell said in his book. Then we have uh, Reinhard Dozi, one of the uh, authorities on the history of uh, Islamic Spain. He states that the Christians preferred the Islamic rule o- over uh, the Christian rule in Spain. Mark, do you accept that there are instances in which Christians and others were happy under their Islamic, if you like, uh, leaders? I think the, the conditions did vary over uh, long, large expanses of time and space. And sometimes they were better than others. And uh, uh, there were times when one religious group uh, may have been better under Muslims than under non-Muslims or felt that better off. Um, there's a diversity of testimony about that. I think there is a, a weakness in, in some Western scholarship. There's a desire to kind of praise this golden age idea. Um, I, I think that's really a mistake. As a, it's a sort of a view of history that's very static, that there's, a, there's these unrelenting centuries of, of enjoyment of uh, peaceful and what, why, what would What would make that's people want, want to present it that way, though? Why, why would they present oh, there's, it? There's various reasons. It began in the 19th century, um, there was a political pressure to 
um, uh, support uh, the Europe, European support for the Ottoman Empire in their battle against the Russians. Um, there was also um, writers wanting to secularists or sometimes Jewish writers wanting to kind of hit Christians over the head and use Islam as a kind of way of um, shaming Christians in the 19th century. There's, um, this is very complex. I discuss it uh, in my book, but let me give you an example, just to give you uh, that there is, there's a diversity of voices on this issue. Uh, Maimonides, a great, one of the greatest Jewish writers from the Middle Ages, who'd grown up in Andalusia in Spain and had to flee uh, persecution there to Egypt, and he wrote this letter to the Jews of Yemen to persecute us severely and devise ways to harm us and to debase us. No nation has ever done more harm to Israel. None has matched it in debasing and humiliating us. None has been able to reduce us as they have. The more we suffer and choose to conciliate them, the more they choose to act belligerently towards us. Now, this is the voice of a, of a very famous um, Jewish writer from the medieval period in the middle of those centuries that um, were described as, as excellent. And it, what, the problem is to be so selective in choosing you know, one voice and not another, not to pay attention to the contrary evidence that there there was a lot of uh, suffering and poverty and forced conversions uh, I mean, and people I, unable to pay their taxes. I appreciate that Adnan probably is going to want to, to, to respond. I mean, one one thing I do want to draw out here, though, is, is that you, you make a point towards the end of the book, Mark, about whether the Christian response is helpful. I mean, in a sense, Jesus said, if your enemy strikes you on one cheek, offer them the other. Christianity is premised on on this kind of um, non-retaliatory sort of uh, premise, if you like. Um, but you say that that this could be interpreted as simply playing into the hands of those who want to establish dimitude again. That this could be seen as a submissive state and, and Islam taking its rightful place, if you like. If 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 the Christian response were carried out in that way, it's kind of a a bit of a dilemma, isn't it? Because yeah, there's an asymmetry of understanding potentially. So. Someone might be generous, thinking they're they're being gracious, you know, making concessions, uh, uh, going out of your way to be peaceful and to conciliate. But the other side might receive all this as a, as their due, as a debt owed. So um, you know, is, 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 if if a European country gives money to Egypt or America gives money to Egypt, is that aid or is it tribute? You know, um, how do you look at the, how do you look at this, these exchanges? Um, and I think that's a big problem for Christians in the West. Sometimes in engaging with Islam, they feel they're, they're trying, really trying hard to be gracious. But is this grace received as grace or is it received as a debt owed, as, a, as evidence of the superiority I, of Islam? I have to confess, in, in my dealings with, um, for instance, down, down at Hyde Park, you know, when, when I've been there at the debates that have taken place between Christians and, and Muslims, I, some of the Christians have, who come from Middle Eastern countries and from places where Islam is dominant actually are frustrated by Western Christians' attitude towards Islam and they say we need a more muscular Christianity I mean we might be coming slightly off topic here Adnan but, but, yes. but <laughs> yeah, that's true I mean the example was in, in the UK where Muslim police said we don't want to wear the crown on our helmets because it's got a tiny cross on it and the British authorities agreed to that I mean I think it's a terrible mistake to take the sign of sovereignty off the helmets of the police to allow that, oh yes, this would have must be very distressing to Muslims to have that on their helmets. So we'll take the British crown uh, off. You know, um, that's a really bad mistake, and uh, it's. It, it, I think it comes across as a sign of weakness, really, uh, and, a, and of, of submission. Of uh, but but do do you agree? Uh, I mean, are these concessions kind of taken by Muslims as kind of somehow their due? Their the, M- Muslims uh, have never been a majority in this country, and they would never take it as a weakness. Rather, they would take it, uh, if it happened, they would take it as a gesture of kindness from the government and a gesture of tolerance from, on government's behalf, uh, and which is beautiful. I don't think it's a mistake. If the government did it, it's a, it's, it's a kind thing to do, it's the right, it's a right thing to do, it's, it's a thing uh, which would uh, enable the Muslims to think that they are valued and they are welcome in this country. Um, and if, the, I mean, unfortunately, the, some of the Christian preachers do come with a message of love and, and, um, and compassion and, and, and um, tolerance. On the other hand, we have some of the Christians campaigning actively in this country against the building of a mosque and uh, they, 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 they are Christians. So we feel as Muslims, th- we feel threatened. We feel, what if the Christians came to power? 
uh, or these evangelical Christians, if they came to power, would they allow us to live in peace? Would they allow us to have our mosques? Coming back to the, mm. my, my, my main issue of um, uh, dimitude, uh, Mark quoted Maimonides from the Middle Ages, uh, and he quoted one of his letters. What Mark failed to acknowledge was that Maimonides was a product of an Islamic society. Maimonides was born in Islamic Spain, expelled by the Almohads who were uh, very harsh in the treatment of the non-Muslims, which is uh, an established fact in history. But on the other hand, Maimonides was protected by Saladin and his judge. Maimonides was due to be executed as an apostate because under persecution he embraced Islam. But when he came to Egypt, he went back to Judaism and he was accused of apostasy. But it was one of the judges of Saladin who came to his rescue and rescued him from that persecution. And he stated that this man is not an apostate because he was never a Muslim. What I see in the book possibly is what Mark uh, is, is doing is that he's cherry picking. Uh, I would ask the, the, the listeners to go and read another book on the other, uh, to see the other side of the picture, which is titled Preaching of Islam by Thomas Arnold published in the year 1913, and a fascinating book documenting uh, all the tolerant and beautiful and good things Muslims did to the non-Muslims. Preaching of Islam, Thomas Arnold, 1913. All right, we'll, we'll thank you for the reference, and um, if we can dig out a copy of that, it would be interesting to see. Uh, Mark, we come to the end of our time now. Um, what, what do you hope um, will be achieved by you uh, writing this book. I mean, you're not writing this uh, presumably to upset anyone. You, you stated at the outset you, you want to kind of make an objective case for, for what the situation is. Yeah, I think um, people in, uh, in the UK or any country should uh, reach out with, with grace and friendship to Muslims and get to know them and realise they're people like themselves and uh, understand what makes them tick and engage with them and love them. We'd say to Christians, love Muslims, um, understand them, but I think that we should make very few, if any, concessions at all to political Islam, to Sharia implementation. Um, there's a survey a few years back in the UK said that 40% of Muslims in the UK support the uh, Sharia law in some form for 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 the UK. Um, but you see, this this discrimination, the treatment of one type of people as a protected people who whose rights are, are given to them by the Muslims and are dependent upon them for their rights. Um, and the privileging of one religious group over another. Um, this is part of Sharia, and uh, it is already kind of creeping its way into our society with restrictions on freedom of speech, asymmetrical uh, limitations um, on, on people's rights. And this needs to be guarded against. I don't think it's helpful. I think ultimately it will undermine peace. It's important to understand what the long-term implications of introducing Sharia law are in the society, and I think we should be friends with Muslims, re reach out to them, but make absolutely no compromises where it comes to Sharia implementation in, uh, in Western societies. Well, thank you for contributing to the program today, and um, we'll let you get on to, uh, to your bed because it's quite late already in your part of Australia. Uh, thank you for joining me today, Mark, and if you want to find out more about Mark, uh, I'm posting up links to where you can find out about him with the <laughs> podcast of this program. That's premier.org.uk forward slash unbelievable you can find details of the book there that we've been looking at as well Adnan thank you very much for coming in thank you so much um, it's, it's been great to have you on for the last two weeks of the, the program and thank you for engaging with Mark today obviously you disagreed with, with almost everything he said but that, I was sort of expecting that um, and uh, I'll, I'll post up a link to, to where people can find out more about you as well so um, thank you for listening today uh, if you have been writing in by email or phoning in with a, a voicemail message, you may be hearing it in just a moment's time. We're going to hear some of your feedback to the last few weeks of programming here on the show that gets Christians and non-Christians talking unbelievable. Unbelievable with Justin Brierley.